Alrighty. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Dan Bornstein. I'm here to tell you a little bit about the Dalvik VM today. Um, I just, by way of intro, I've been with the Android project for a little over three years now, which is just about as long as it's been a project within Google. Um, and if you saw the presentation I gave at Google I.O., uh, most of these slides are going to be familiar with you, f f familiar to you. Um, but uh, I've kind of compacted it down just so I can give an overview for anyone who isn't familiar with it. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, what we're working on right now towards the end. And hopefully after a fairly brief talk, I'll open up for Q&A. And, a, and um, basically feel free to, to ask anything you want as long as it's not confidential uh, because this is going to go out on YouTube. And uh, so just hold your confidential questions till after the talk. Thanks. Okay. So you've probably all seen this diagram. This is the big picture of Android. Um, so there's, there's a lot of stuff there from the kernel all the way up through applications. Uh, all I'm talking about is the virtual machine. So um, if, again, if you want to ask questions outside that area, I'll, I'll try to wing it. But uh, this is, this is what I'm concentrating on today. So you write your applications in the Java programming language uh, for Android, and they get translated at compilation time, at build time, into a form that runs on Dalvik. And so what's the, what's the point of, of the VM? So you know, in the context of a mobile device, you have a relatively slow uh, CPU. You have, don't have much RAM. Uh, we're running an operating system that doesn't use swap space. There's not much point to that in our, in our context. And there's one major constraint, which is that most of the time you're, you're running off of a battery. And I cannot stress enough how much, the, how much of a concern battery life is and how much that affects all of the decisions that, that we've made in building Android. Um, so, you know, batteries do keep getting better but it's, it's, not a more, it's not at the pace of Moore's Law, say. So one of the things that, that uh, we do to, uh, in, in Dalvik is try to address the problems of memory efficiency. So you can, you can see uh, just kind of some basic stats there about what a typical system might look like. Actually, for us, it's, this is sort of the baseline low-level, um, sort of like a low-end system. So, for example, on the on the uh, the phone that's out there, uh, you have considerably more RAM. So it's something like 100 megs is available to uh, to the the operating system. Um, but in any case, about 24 megs of that is used to get just to get Linux up and running. Um, and there's higher level services. So there's you know, as a phone, you want to be able to answer phone calls. Um, there's data, data network traffic has to happen in the background. All of these things are running in, in, proce in separate processes. They all take memory. So anyway, so you know, the, uh, the more we can get out of the memory, the better. Um, and oh, I should, should add that um, in addition to all that, one of the things that we did for Android was have a security model where process separation is sort of the, the unit of isolation and, and trust. And so that meant it was not, an, not a viable option for us to, say, run multiple applications together in a single process if those applications weren't going to trust each other. And one final bit is we wanted to provide a fairly rich application framework, and there's real memory involved with that. And so you know, we didn't want to, say, have 10 megs per process use, you know, for, for this, so we have to do something to uh, make that work better for us. So here's just a simple illustration of one of the things that we do to help. Um, again, the application code you write, it's written in the Java programming language. You use normal tools to compile that. Um, so you know, Java C or your favorite compiler. You turn it into a jar file, and then you run this tool that we call DX. And what DX does is it takes all the classes of a jar file and kind of takes all that information and it rearranges it um, into a different form that avoids a lot of 
uh, eliminates a lot of redundancy that, that uh, occurred between the classes and even within classes. Um, and it also makes the result into a form that's usable sort of as is, just as a memory mapped file. So the act of loading a DEX file um, really uh, gets to avoid a lot, of, a lot of this initial sort of file loading and file parsing. It's just kind of all there. And finally, it, uh, the, uh, one of the final thing that, it, that happens when a DEX file is created is the bytecode from the original classes is rewritten into a new form. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute or two. So I, I mentioned uh, memory mapping files. And the point about this is that read-only files can be loaded into RAM in, as what's called um, clean memory. And what that means is that the kernel can eject that memory, can use it for something else, knowing full well that, hey, there's this file that's backing it up, and it can always load it back in if it needs to. And so that helps uh, reduce the memory pressure on the system. Um, on the other hand, dirty memory is memory where it's, say, explicitly allocated by a process. It's not backed up, backed by any file. The kernel can't simply eject that memory because there's no way to recreate it. If ejecting that memory is tantamount to effectively killing that process. Um, however, um, so dirty memory is bad, but if we can manage to share it, then we can kind of reduce the overall system cost of that. And so that's, one of, that's another one of the things that we do on, on the memory front. So uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we have this thing we call the zygote. And it is a process that starts off at, at boot time. And it load, does this preloading of a lot of classes. And once, it's, once all these classes are preloaded, it, can, it then sits on a socket. It waits for commands. And the command is usually to fork and become a new application process. And what happens is the heap that was created by the zygote through all of this preloading then gets shared copy on write with each of these child processes. And we've arranged things so that um, even though it's, it is copy on write, writes don't actually happen very often. So it's mostly just shared. OK. And so again, uh, with, a, with a little mobile device, one of the things we, we care about is getting as much performance out of the CPU as we can. Um, again, this is, this is sort of a typical, typical Android device stats. Um, the, the, uh, the, the G1 is kind of right in the, in the middle there on CPU speed. I think we run at 384 megahertz when the screen is on, the user is active. Um, and again, there's 100 megs of RAM total for the Linux side of things. A good chunk of that's taken up by the system. There's, you know, tens of megs left for applications. And we want, uh, I, mean, I talked about that already. OK. Anyway, so um, in terms of the CPU speed, one of the things that, we're, that we try to do is, put, is arrange for the, the bytecode that gets run um, to, uh, to kind of avoid as much stuff as possible. Um, sometimes I say that, that my job as sort of a VM guy is to run as little code as possible. It should all be the user's code, ideally. So. One of, the thing, one of the things that we do is, at install time, do a bunch of work up front to verify classes. And this means that we don't have to do that same verification every time, say, you start up an app. And uh, verification is really about in ensuring the type safety, the reference safety of, of the system. For Android, this isn't so much about platform security as it is about intra-app security. So we're trying to provide some guarantees that when you write code that it's, you know, it's kind of saving you from your own bugs in a way or um, helping, say, uh, mitigate any, um, any exploits that might happen. But again, it's most, that's mostly about what's happening within the process, not, not about what's happening across processes. And then the other thing we do at install time is optimization. And we actually do rewrite some bytecodes to be faster versions. We do 
Um, we do static linking. Um, we notice empty methods. We do. There's a there's a few things along along these lines that we do that in the end mean that when you're actually finally executing the code, you can do things a little bit faster. Okay. And uh, so about the bytecode. So the thing that we do is again um, when we're reading in class files, we take that that original bytecode, which is which uses a machine model that includes both a stack and a set of a set of local variables, effectively a set of registers, and we convert it into a form that uses only registers. And the reason we do this is that um, by doing so, we can avoid a lot of of memory accesses during interpretation, both in terms of reading the instruction stream, because the instruction stream becomes more semantically dense, so we interpret fewer instructions. But also, we avoid this motion between, say, stack, between the stack and, and locals, um, so we can, say, um, skip a couple of read-write steps in a lot of cases. And so this, again, helps keep memory traffic down and helps keep the speed of the interpreter up. And uh, so about the interpreter, so you know why are why are we obsessing about that when you know these are the days of jits and all that? Well, um, so just just in case uh, just in case you don't know, a jit jit stands for just in time, and it refers to um, a VM implementation where you compile bytecode to machine code just before you execute it, and the idea is that having compiled that code into, into machine code, that, that should run faster than the original interpreted code. And in general, that's, that's true, but there are downsides. Um, and the big downsides are that, uh, that the assembled code, or the, the, machine, the equivalent machine code is usually less dense than the original bytecode, so that adds to memory pressure. Um, and, um, and 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 also the act of doing the compilation itself takes energy. It takes battery. It, so if not done, uh, if not done prudently, could lead to a reduction in battery life. And so for for the 1.0 version of Android, we really decided not to go with a, a JIT at all. And so you can you can see the reasons here. Basically, um, we spent a lot of time building native code for the for the cases where we knew there would be um, CPU bound ac activity, so things such as graphics and audio and video and stuff like that. And we provide uh, for plat for the platform, we provide JNI so that you know should you need to to add some facility that could you could stand to use uh, the native speed, you can you can do that. Um, again, that's for platform development, not for app development today. Um, we are looking into doing a native development kit. Eventually, there will be a, a solution there. We're, we're not, we're not quite ready with that yet. So, but the future, um, we are actually investigating doing a JIT, and the thing is, we want to do it right. Um, so again, you know, it require the the JIT cache requires memory. We don't want to use so much memory that, say, you if you used to be able to keep say six processes hot in the system, that you could only keep say five. We want to, We really want to maintain the. At, sort of at the system level, um, we want the performance to become better, not, not worse. So basically, we want to have app performance, with, with our JIT work, we want the app performance to increase without, without decreasing the, the overall system performance. Um, and uh, just, just as a uh, sort of uh, aside in this, again, because we don't trust because the unit of trust is the process, an application process will should be able to say JIT its own code, but we can't necessarily trust an app to JIT code for some other process. So if we're trying to do something where we're having a shared a shared code cache, we have to be very careful about how we arrange that. And so that's that's it about JITs. And I just wanted to talk a little bit um, about garbage collection. So this is one other area that we're looking to address kind of in the medium term. Um, our current garbage collector is imprecise and it doesn't compact. 
Um, and that was actually good enough for 1.0. Um, but in the long run, we do want to have a precise, a, a fully precise GC. We probably want to have it be able to compact. Um, we may want it to, you can see, we, we may want um, thread, thread local allocation pools, which help speed up allocation. Maybe incremental, maybe having an incremental GC will be a, a good thing. Still unclear. Our pause times are, are usually low enough that, that the user doesn't notice, but it could still, you know, it could still uh, improve things a little bit. Okay, and that's all I had for you. That, that was the whirlwind tour of, Dal of Dalvik as it exists today and what we're working on. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Um, in the back. Mm. So the question was, what are my thoughts on install time compilation rather than JIT? Um, so there's a, I would say the, the one big, con the one major concern there is actually flash space, which I didn't really mention during the talk, but flash space is also at a premium on, on the device. And again, because the, uh, the machine code is, le is considerably less dense than the byte code, that would reduce the number of applications that you could have on, g for a given amount of flash space. Um, I expect that eventually we will have ahead of time compilation for some stuff uh, in some form or another. For example, um, for the core system, for, like for, the, for the framework, there's a lot of stuff where you know it's going to be hot or you know it it's could use some optimization. And it would be nice to have, say, the, and still be able to say write that in in the high level code rather than having to sort of resort to JNI for, for those things. Uh, eventually, so, but what I would say is that kind of in, in terms of the roadmap, doing, doing a JIT seems, seems to me like it's going to be the sort of like bigger bang for the buck. Um, and it, once, you know, once we have something there that, that seems to work, maybe it will be time to look at doing kind of a more formal ahead of time system as well. Oh, uh, Dan? Yes. So the question was, can I outline the transformation from the stack-oriented machine to the the stackless register-based machine? Um, yeah. So the the there's a, a couple a couple stages of the translation. Um, it's the the first pass really just takes uh, the stack. So you know, in normal job in in Java bytecode. Um, as, you know, you push it, push things onto the stack, and the stack grows, and you know, you pop things off the trees. The, one of the nice features about Java bytecode is that, um, without running a a method, you know at any, at any given for any given instruction what where it's where it's actually pushing that value. You know the the, the stack depth at the time of that instruction, so you really can can translate that fairly directly into a register number. So the first stage of, of translation, really um, a push turns into a move from, a, say, a push of a local from that local's register number to the register, sort of synthetic register number for that position in the stack. So that's sort of step one. And with that, you actually don't get a reduction in, in memory traffic because, hey, you're, you've translated from one form of moving from memory to memory to another form. But we also do... A, a pass over um, the code. We actually we actually parse it into into basic blocks, and we do an SSA transformation on that, um, where um, we kind of actually expand things out. There's even more registers in this intermediate form, um, but it gets to notice where um, where moves are effectively redundant, where and it can then eliminate those on the way back out into the final bytecode form. Is that close enough? Okay. Sure. Actually, I think, give me a second, I think I have a slide for that. So give me two seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was uh, asking for detail about the instruction set itself. So one moment. And I 
think I can give that to you. So here's a, just a, a few examples of, uh, of instructions. I didn't get every possible kind of format variation, but you can kind of see how, how they look. Um, so instructions always are, ver are always explicit about what registers they're using. You can see them in blue here. So our registers are prefixed by V in our version just to avoid confusion with R being used for typical machine registers. Um, so that first instruction is uh, moving a 16-bit constant into, uh, into a register. Uh, the second one there, new instance, is creating an un uninitialized instance of a class. Um, so the type, you can see it says type uh, 0 ABC. That's, that refers to a constant pool index for a type. So that could be a, you know, Android dot view dot view or, a, you know, what have you. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That Yeah, it stores the result in V1 in that case. And for the first one, it's storing the result in V2. Our, um, yeah, our, our mnemonics are whatever. Our, our form, format is always destination, then, then sources. Um, or destination, if any, then sources. So throw V9, that's, th that's uh, throwing an exception. Uh, so it's presumed that there is an exception object in V9 that causes it to be thrown. No, that's an unconditional throw. So if you wanted to have a conditional throw, it would. Be. Oh, oh yeah, no, this is not meant. Yeah, this, this is not a um, a method. <laughs> this is just a, just examples of instructions. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, anyway, so you, you, I think you get you get the idea from, from that. Um, so I don't know. Is, do you have any? Anyone have any questions about any of the other ones? Or? Oh, okay. Um, so invoke virtual. So there's a family of opcodes to to invoke methods. Um, methods tend to take variable numbers of arguments. So what you can see here is a version where um, you can have up to four arguments, and each of those arguments has to be in a uh, register uh, between zero and fifteen. So um, in in the in the Dalvik bytecode. Registers 0 through 15 are pretty much available for any op opcode that takes registers. And then there's sort of longer versions for uh, if you need to refer to registers that are higher. And then actually there's, there's longer, it's, it's, not, it's not completely orthogonal, but then there's, there's um, uh, say, a bunch of, of opcodes that deal with, or a bunch of variants that deal with up to 256 registers. And then if you really have a lot of registers, there are move instructions to let you move between um, the, say, the first 256 and the w any one up to 65,535. Um, so in, in the case of the invokes, there are two variants, uh, two general variants of each invoke. One is the one that takes the, these low registers. Uh, oh, and you know, I think I misspoke. I think I said up to four registers. It's actually up to up to f it's up to five arguments in that that form. Um, and the other version is one that has to take a contiguous range of registers, and otherwise it would have to be a variable length instruction. And we erred on the side of having all instructions be fixed width. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 64K registers. Um, oh, so over there. So the question is: Is there any way to have the uh, the system have have an app that generates bytecode on the on the fly? Um, this is actually a deficiency in 1.0. It's the um, the the virtual machine code itself is has no problem with with that. You can basically get your dex file from wherever you feel like it, including from you know from an SD card or from from your own private storage. You can generate right to a file that it. I mean. Um, so that's the, but that's the underlying VM. The Android system um, had a requirement that, um, that had a requirement which precluded that from hap from happening um, in terms of how the whole system was put together. 
basically there's a cache directory that is not that needed to be writable. So um, we fix that for a later release, and I don't I don't think I don't think it's made it out into an actually. Let me let me go over here to my <laughs> my my esteemed uh, coworker. Okay, it's in Cupcake. <laughs> so when Cupcake comes out, um, that you should be able to do that. So, so the question was, is there an API for assembling bytecodes, or do you have to do it yourself? Yeah, there's no API right now. So I have kind of been hoping that someone would put together something like BCEL for for DEX files, um, but uh, that hasn't happened yet, and we ha we haven't had the time to do anything like that ourselves at the in, in the meantime. Uh, in the back. I'm sorry. Sorry. It's oh, sorry. What's the, what's the question again? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So the question is, if I, if if you happen to have a bunch of bytecode hanging around, could you convert it, convert it to DEX? So, um, in fact, th so the the tool, you know, during uh, during build time, there's a tool that does exactly that. Um, I've seen a proof of concept of somebody running that on a device. Um, but again, it, it has the same problem, at least for the 1.0 release, where having done that, you can't get that to run today. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so um, to, to repeat the question, so the, the question is, or uh, statement is, well, if there's ASM or, or, or B cell, well, why don't you just generate your code with that and then convert it? Um, convert it to w using DX and use that as your as kind of your path to loading up a DEX file, and that's that's absolutely a, a valid way to, to proceed. Um, my belief is that um, I mean, I, 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 actually, I don't think I don't think it could be argued that 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 is less efficient than a theoretical thing that sort of combines those functions. Um, and for somebody who's interested in that level of efficiency. Something, something BCEL like, but specific to, to Dalvik would probably make sense. But yeah, absolutely, as a as, as a short term solution, that absolutely makes sense. Yes. So um, the, the point is the point is that uh, there is a larger ecology than than Android and. Any code that you use doing that is applicable to the to other other stuff as well, and that's also absolutely true. Okay. Anything else? Front. Um, question regarding particular jets. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to make a lot of sense, especially when you send it to me, you've got to uh, load classes and then you know add this thing to this. I mean, it seems like the easiest way right now to do it is by just sending it to me. Is that is it optimized? Be sure to repeat the question. We can't hear up here in Seattle. Yeah, the the question is still ongoing. <laughs> so, um, so I can think that this might make sense. But on the other hand, I well, I don't know. A, a lot of this is tech, though, actually. Um, given that you could think of well, uh, like the object that that you add as an attribute, and I still know that in a year or so, this will default. Okay, this is going to be a hard question to repeat. <laughs> um, so, actually, why, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you break it into a quick sound bite that I can? So, so uh, that I can. Uh, um, I mean, the first thing was more JIT, right? So yeah. Like, uh, JIT uh, makes sense in this kind of case, but the actual question is. So, first part is yay JIT. So 
and then the, the second half is, but eventually there's going to be lots of flash and maybe ahead of time compilation is the way to go. Um, so, and what gives? Um, so uh, the, the, way I would, the way I would think about it, so first of all, ap you're absolutely right, you know, think their memory is going to get, you know, vaster over time. And so the argument of, hey, we better conserve flash space so that we can have, you know, a few paltry apps on, on a device or whatever, that, that won't hold water, say, in three years. Um, and so then the question is, what about ahead of, ahead of time compilation then? And the thing that I would probably be thinking about at that point is that there is that there are a proliferation of architectures on which Android hopes to run. And so if you have to compile down to, if you only, say you only support ahead of time compilation um, or you support it as sort of like the primary way of delivery, that, that will limit what architectures a given deployment will run on. Um, so, um, uh, 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 so that's sorry. That's for for build time, um, and then there's also ins there's also install time. So that means uh, ahead of time testing. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so for in install time, I think it's it's a little less clear. Um, I don't have. I, rather, you know, ra rather than hand wave too much, I don't. I uh, let me just say, I don't know. You know, it's like what I know is that what we're looking at. It, for what we're looking at today, the thing that, that makes the most sense to work on, at least to me, is is, is a JIT, given that this is something that we want to deploy, you know, sooner rather than later, um, say in three years or whatever, two years maybe even, the, the landscape may have changed enough that it's it's worth reevaluating that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't predict the future. So. But yeah, fair point. So uh, to re repeat that statement, it's that um, ahead of time doesn't get you a lot of sort of real real time profiling and recompilation. Um, and actually, I just I didn't want to take up that argument, <laughs> but <laughs> which is um, so I and the reason not not because I don't believe it, it's just because I I am not an expert on that. I I don't know how the, how how that that compares. So I just. Um, so say in three years when we're evaluating this, right. maybe we will find that um, that the profile-driven stuff will make it a clear win to continue doing JIT. Or maybe not. I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah? Do you see questions? Okay. Question is, um, there's this thing in Java bytecode or that's coming soon, I don't, I don't know what its current status is, called Invoke Dynamic. Um, and this is a new opcode that was introduced, uh, or that is in, in the process of being introduced, okay, um, to support uh, dynamic languages. I think the prime, the prime one is uh, Ruby, um, although I know it's, it's meant to not just be a Ruby-specific opcode, but for, uh, for languages that have a similar kind of dispatch. And are we going to do something like that for Android? And if so, what will it look like? Um, so what I, I'm, I think I have said this publicly before, um, so I will, I guess I'm repeating myself. Um, I, am, I am and uh, we as the Dalvik team are interested in feedback from people trying to use Dalvik kind of on the edge. Um, you know, uh, we don't want to come out with Say a change, a, a change to uh, the format that doesn't, that won't in fact meet the needs of the people trying to solve whatever problems they're, they're solving. So I don't know what uh, an invoke dynamic like thing would look like. Um, I hereby solicit feedback from the folks who care about that sort of thing. 
um, so that we c if we do it, we can do it right. Oh, I'm sorry, VC. Hello, um, I'm interested in doing, uh, well, personally doing like, say, game applications on the platform, but I know it's, uh, you mentioned it lacks uh, incremental VC, I mean, incremental garbage collector, which would certainly work to lower uh, the worst case delay. So I'm just wondering, you know, is, is uh, kind of support for high frame rate kind of smooth animation applications in the scope of what you intend with the Android platform? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we would like to ideally support high frame rate and, you know, no, um, no skips, all, all that. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I don't know that I can say where it will, where it sort of sits on the roadmap. Um, so, you know, in the, in the short term for doing for doing games um, on the system, you do have to worry about, say, like, not doing a lot of allocation during your your main loop and stuff like that. Um, you know, a, we'll get there eventually. Um, I don't I don't know that I have anything to tell you that you know, like, yeah, it's going to be there in a week or anything like that. It's it's sort of you know, in in the longer term, we are we are hoping to get the, those those kind of things in place. Um, the way the way I, I tend to think about it is not not that app developers can use native code yet. Um, again, we're trying to trying to address that. Um, but the way I see it is that um, the work that we do on the VM is sort of kind of altering the bar of where it makes sense to resort to native code. So um, our, with our goal nominally being to make it such that you would never feel the need to actually use native code, even if that facility were there. Um, okay, on the desktop. Um, the question is, how does Dalvik perform on the desktop, um, especially compared to the Sun interpreter? Um, I don't know numbers offhand. I th thought it was Actually, please correct me if I'm wrong. Fairly comparable to uh, the Sun interpreter. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember exactly. I know that actually there's um, a group who was actually doing some investigation on running on the desktop, and Dalvik had it was sort of like it was like a slightly better startup time, um, and it's, I think everything else was sort of in, in the same ballpark. Um, do you know? Okay. Uh, none of my cohort have uh, additions to make. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, VJ. Is, is he up there? Anyway. Anyway, in the back. Um, the question is, could uh, could Dalvik be used to run uh, Java applets on Android in some form or another? So, okay. Um, so there's a the there's two pieces that are missing from say today's kind of bundle bundled Android system that 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 prevent that from happening. Um, one is um, that there is there there is no, um, the, the DX tool that converts classes to DEX files is not set up to, to run on the device today. A, again, I've, the, a proof of concept has been done that shows that that could be done. Um, and then the other is that there is a lot of missing pieces of uh, library code that would be required. And in order to do it, you would have to solve the problem of kind of the, it's a, it's a different, Sort of, there's different UI expectations for for an applet compared to what Android is prepared to to present. So, for example, um, applets can actually have um, overlapping windows. They can like you know pop out windows. Um, we don't really have anything like that on Android today. So that would have to be kind of recreated from in some form or another. Um, applets more or less tend to expect that there's a mouse cursor, like a mouse pointer and a multi 
probably a multi-button mouse, or effectively a multi-button mouse. So there's there's things like that would have to be addressed. Um, we haven't tried to do that. Um, I think if you look at the so as a as a platform development project, I think that's something that could be under undertaken. Um, not that we're planning on doing that, but it's a sufficiently interested party could take the code and try to put that together. Um, you couldn't just say build an app today on Android that itself allowed you to run applets. It would have to be it, it would have to be addressed. I think it would have to be addressed from at the platform level. So the, the comment was maybe server-side compilation could help. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, that could, that could be part of part of a solution. Although I I think the I, I if it were me doing it, I would I wouldn't want to rely on a server to be there to do the translation. I would rather actually have it be able to run on the loop. Yeah. So the question is, compare and contrast Dalvik with other VMs that are around today. Hmm. Um, and um, do, should we expect to see a lot more VMs in the future, like of yeah. different styles? Um, so, I mean, I, in the in the overview, I tried to go over what the highlights of what we did. Um, and I, I picked those highlights because these, th these are things that are not, that we haven't seen being done a lot in, um, in, other, in other VMs. Um, so in particular, the amount of attention we put towards the sharing of memory and the ability to use um, uh, executables kind of in, in, in place with memory mapping, that's, I think th those are, um, those are kind of the, the big ticket items on that front. Um, uh, are there going to be more VMs? I mean, I think, you know, any, I don't know, you know, any new situation, say, might warrant a new virtual machine. Um, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what those are offhand. Um, How about this? Oh, okay. So, well, it's kind of okay. So, how how about the question was how about uh, Dalvik being used in Android versus being used elsewhere? Um, so, there are yeah the the scope of the applicability of of this is actually to anything that's kind of on the more constrained side, certainly on the more mobile side. Um, I think uh, I was actually very interested in following the coverage from CES this year, where we actually. Um, like I, I, I don't know if anyone else in in this building w had seen it, but it looked like there were a couple of non-phone devices, or actually non-mobile phone devices that were built using Android. Um, and I mean, I wasn't like surprised to see it, but it was it, it was, yeah, you know, I, I think it was it was interesting to see that, that that's already starting to happen. The question is, uh, how stable is the is the DEX format? Um, do we expect to see backwards compatibility with, say, with a file that you produced today, say, several years from now? Um, my hope is that we will have um, backwards compatibility ongoing. I suspect that we will. Uh, I won't be. Let's have this. I won't be surprised if we add if we add instructions. I don't think we. You know, I don't think we're going to remove any. Um, and if we do any um, non-backwards compatible change to the, say, to the file format, we'll probably maintain a, a backwards compatible loader. So, you know, we may load two different versions of, of, of the file. But I, I expect that as a sort of, from, from a platform stand, standpoint, we wish to maintain compatibility with, with 
files that are produced today. Um, so the question is, uh, holding up a G1, uh, here, let me approximate. I don't know what's, what processes in, processor is in here, but does it have 16 registers and, uh, or are you doing something else? And are those being mapped in Dalvik or are you doing something else? Okay. <laughs> okay. The answer is actually, I do know what processor is in, is in there. Um, it's a, um, it, it, the the CPU runs the ARM instruction set, um, and in fact, it does have 16, uh, 16 more or less general purpose registers, um, with caveats for people who know ARM already, and you know what I mean. Um, and no, we don't map them. We we don't map the Dalvik registers directly to to hardware registers in the interpreter. In fact, every Every virtual register is represented as a piece of memory on a uh, on a on a Dalvik stack. So when you are doing memory operations or when you're doing register operations in the interpreter, you are absolutely moving from moving memory from you know you're loading and storing to real memory. Um, and so the thing that I was when I was talking about converting from uh, Java bytecode to Dalvik bytecode. The, when I, the, that first level of translation where we, where we synthesize register numbers for each point in the stack. So at that point, if, if you just interpreted that, then the memory, the, the memory traffic for that would be, to a first approximation, identical between the original and the, the Dalvik version. But the thing that we do is, uh, once we have it in a register form, we can do optimizations such that we can remove a lot of those register usages. And then those removed register usages become re removed memory traffic in the, when interpreting. Okay. Question. Uh, the question is, how about Dalvik in a browser? Um, because uh, it, a lot of the things that you're interested in in a browser environment are similar to the things that uh, we're interested in in the mobile environment. Um, yeah, I think I think it could be applicable. Um, so I, you know, I I don't know. I, get, I should say, I, 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 will, I will plead ignorance on what the sort of state of the art in sort of browser internals is. So I, I would hesitate to say, yeah, great fit, you know, go for it. Uh, I, I also don't want to say like, oh, that would never work. Um, I, just, I just don't know. Um, it, sure, it sounds like it, it, could, it could work. Okay, one, uh, maybe two more questions. Or maybe zero more questions. <laughs> Oh, 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 I'm sorry. In front. Oh. Um, the statement is um, a lot of the things that uh, Android does, including uh, with at the say at the kernel level, uh, where we use user IDs to separate processes and stuff like that, is is not something that you would sort of get for free in the browser world. And so there will be a lot of work to to be done at that level. And the answer is yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, okay, back there. Last last question.
So the, the question was, I mentioned that uh, somebody had gotten DX to run on device, and what, w what did the size of that look like, and is that something that we should expect to see in some future incarnation of, of the platform? Um, you know, I don't know how, how large that was. Um, so I, I'd say there, there are no immediate plans to include that as part of, as sort of part of the uh, part of a, a platform build. Um, what I would ex would actually expect to see is again something a little more sort of purpose built for generating code on on device rather than having to sort of bounce through a couple of hoops. Okay, well thank you all very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you.